So we are going to get started. It's week two. Welcome. Uh, today's topic is talking about where this fits in as a career. So as we know, with advanced exercise physiology and focusing on really primarily pathophysiology, I want to speak about the profession of the clinical exercise physiologist. So I'm going to go through some of the some of our slides together and um, share with you. Um, you know, when you think about what is a clinical exercise physiologist, um, how do we get there, where do they work, some of those basics. So um, as you may know, I remember you, I've got this RCEP, RCEP. Uh, recently, there's been changes in the levels of certification. I'm a registered clinical exercise physiologist. Right now, the exam to sit to become a clinical exercise physiologist. Um, you can have a master's degree with hours or an undergraduate, a bachelor's degree with even more hours. And we'll talk more about that. And then they also are beginning to look at um, where you get your degree, so the, the quality of the university. So if the university has an accredited program, what that will what that means you need for hours going in to, to sit for the exam. But anyway, so let's kind of take a look first at the history. So the breadth of CEPs is um, you know, what are some of the things that we need to be aware of and, and, and be confident in knowing? Um, obviously, anatomy, it's great if you have a cadaver lab. Um, many universities do have cadavers for you to learn anatomy. There's just a very different level of understanding when you've got an actual body instead of just photos. Um, so the majority of universities do have cadaver labs. We don't here at Akron, but um, that is an ideal situation to learn. Physiology, so as um, most of your classes have some type of organ system, cellular, molecular, and then what happens with stress and exercise. Chemistry, we don't have any chemistry requirements in our degree, but many will require some chemistry, organic and biochem. And then psychology, because so much of this is behavior modification, behavior change with counseling and coaching. So um, most CEPs um, have an undergraduate and or graduate in one of these related fields, kinesiology, exercise science, exercise physiology, um, should have done some type of a clinical internship even if it's not required by the academic program, that's what they're looking for for a lot of the exams is have you been in a clinical environment to understand unhealthy patients? And then obviously passing an accreditation certification, which is what the profession is moving. It's not mandated. You are um, certified, but it's beginning to move. And if you spend some time on e Indeed looking at jobs, most will say preferred certification. So the formal use of exercise has been going on for well over 50 years, kind of the history behind this. These are some of the big um, key points of where and how our career developed from. So the Harvard Fatigue Lab was a really big original lab that did a lot of research in the human body and exercise. Sid Robinson studied the aging process um, that the influence in Europe in the 50s and 60s was understanding the benefit of getting people out of bed rest and getting them moving and how that accelerated the healing process. Um, here in the United States, uh, the Cooper Lab, which is Ken Cooper, which is known as the Aerobics Institute, fabulous place. Um, there are, they do take internships, but take a look at the Cooper Institute. Um, the Herman Hellerstam for, with prolonged sitting, all of the information we have about being sedentary and sit time, and then all of the stuff that's happened since the 80s in cardiac rehab has really fueled the profession. So in the mid-60s, the U.S. Surgeon General published its first report on the, the benefits of physical activity. So this big push um, in the United States to get people moving. In 2007, there's a combination between the Center of Disease Control and the American College of Sports Medicine updating activity guidelines. So looking at the link between chronic disease and activity patterns, which is what you've spent most of the time and most of your classes talking about is the link between sedentary behavior and arthrosclerosis and cancer and heart disease and all of those things. So all of this has come, our whole career has come out of research. We once, a bazillion decades ago, were just simply physical educators, right? Your old fashioned so-called gym teachers. And that physical education led to kinesiology and more understanding about movement. And then you combined it with medicine and the understanding of what's going on when people have illnesses and how the benefit of increased blood flow and circulation and skeletal muscle mass really helps to improve uh, 
um, life, morbid morbidity, mortality, all of those good things. So um, I probably should turn off my um, mail. There we go. So you don't have to look at my stuff popping in. So what's going on right now is we know that most of the main causes of death, we call those chronic diseases, have an relationship with being sedentary, right? People that are not moving. So we are seeing increased rise of cancer, predominantly the two that are linked with exercise or being sedentary, breast cancer, colon, and prostate. Obviously heart disease, you know it is cardiovascular disease. So heart disease, stroke, um, pre uh, peripheral vascular disease, so that's leg pain, um, and it usually at the, the arteries and the extremities, um, the vascular system with causing stroke, and we have a lot of heart failure, right? So weakened heart. So CVD is really big. Um, more than just arteries in the heart, we've got all of the circulatory system in which being sedentary increases um, arthrosclerosis and um, ischemia. Falling, a big problem with falling as people are sedentary and weak and balance. Um, bone, brittle bones with osteopenia and osteoporosis, quality of life, well-being, people unable to live independently, really big problem with non-insulin dependent diabetes. So non-insulin dependent diabetes, we you know that as we're type 2 or adult onset diabetes, the vocabulary has changed over the years. But obviously most of this is due to adipose cells. So as people gain fat, the inability for that insulin to be properly utilized. And then our mental state, which is really prevalent right now with COVID, is mental illness, moods, mental problem, you know, um, stability with um, mental health problems, being linked to being sedentary. So diseases and conditions related to lack of um, exercise, obviously it's going to trigger, as I mentioned, obesity, increased fat, um, osteoarthritis, so stiff bones, the more you don't move, right, the, the more stiff you become. Um, every physical therapist tells you motion is lotion, so the more they move, the more you've got that fluid in those joints. Overall mortality, premature mo mortality, sarcopenia, all of these things that you've spent so much time studying. So the scope right now for the clinical exercise physiologist is overseeing, I've got a couple of different organizations, right? So we've got data from the US Department of Labor Bureau and Labor Stats that you can look into. We have data that comes from CEPA, Clinical Exercise Physiology Association. This is the organization I am very involved with. I would um, encourage you to come visit um, the website and take a look at how you may benefit from some of the information on the CEPA website. Um, obviously, ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, is another organization that um, I'm involved with. And again, if you're not a student member, I encourage you to become a student member. The memberships for students while you right now are in grad school is a fraction of what it will be once you get a job. So go ahead and join some of these professional organizations, put them on your resume and get involved. ACE, American Council on Exercise, and then um, there is an organization in Canada as well as in Australia for um, both societies for exercise physiologists that really provide a lot of good data to help fuel our profession. So the future direction which we're going into is enhanced accept, um, acceptance within the healthcare field. So uh, recognizing CEPAs, um, or CEPs, drop the A, so clinical exercise physiologists as an allied health professional. So more and more physicians, um, rehabs, cardiac, pulmonary, cancer, really widening um, the use and the employment of where people are getting jobs, continuing the development of the, of the CEPA as, as a profession. So the growth and advancement across um, the United States is really moving, and I'll talk more about that near the end of the lecture, continued enhancement of understanding what we need to do as more research is coming out just even right now during COVID, um, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit uh, employs quite a few great exercise physiologists. They've been doing research on the benefit of exercise with COVID. So I'm sharing this with you because just knowing about the heart and the lungs, we need more than that. And understanding who are some of the leaders in the field is another important thing for you to know. I have a list of journals. I think in every class we ask you to find peer-reviewed research articles. And I think it's important to not just know the database that you should be looking into, but what are some of the journal names? So obviously if you become a member of ACSM, 
you're going to have access to the journals for free. So um, ACSM's Health and Fitness Journal, the American Journal of Cardiology, Clinical Nutrition, the American Journal of Physiology is a very nice, uh, nice one, American Journal of Sports Medicine, Annals of Internal Medicine, Archives of Internal Medicine, British Journal of Sports Medicine, the Canadian Journal of Applied Physiology, Circulation. Um, you know, I'm not going to read all in all of these, but I'm going to tell you that on these these websites on these slides, listing these journals are where you want to go to for some of the most um, recently published information on how exercise is being used in healthcare. How is exercise being used in injury prevention and injury rehab um, with obesity? The Journal of Clinical Exercise Physiology. This is one if you join CEPA, you again will have free access. It'll be right on, you'll have access right off the website. So, um, obesity, American Medical Association, pediatric exercise. I know many of you mentioned working with um, PEDS in the discussion board. Uh, Research Quarterly for Exercise and Sport is another one. If you've had Dr. Cornspan or Dr. Duve, you may have um, heard them talk about some of these journals as well. So those are important slides of just where to go to. Where are people working? So what we know is most are working in rehab. So 43% it says cardiac rehab. That also would fit into a lot of pulmonary rehab. More and more hospitals are calling their cardiac rehab clinics cardiopulmonary rehab, so it's a joint clinic, um, commercial fitness facilities or community centers. A lot of our community fitness facilities are now owned by hospitals. So if you think right here in Akron, we have Akron General Wellness Center, which is now obviously the clothing clinic, but we have a lot of, or SUMA's um, fitness facility, a lot of our fitness facilities are now medically managed. So we want more clinically trained professionals like yourselves to be on the fitness, fitness floor. A hospitals, corporate fitness. So what is corporate fitness, right? These are big corporations. Goodyear is an example where they would employ a clinical exercise physiologist to work with their employees to help keep costs lower. Hospitals, um, physical therapy clinics will often employ a CEP. Um, some schools, definitely weight loss, bariatric weight loss clinics, cancer centers, all of these. Right now, the only state that requires a CEP to be licensed is in Louisiana. There um, is movement in the profession growing that way. Years and years ago, this happened with athletic training, where athletic trainers um, had to become certified, licensed, and that's beginning to, there's some movement within the field of um, CEPs, but again, right now it's only Louisiana that you have to have a state license to practice here in Ohio. It's just recommended you have a certification, one of our big certifications. So important legal questions that need to be answered during the licensing process is what services can an exercise physiolog physiologist lawfully provide? Um, what practices can be performed? Um, what should be prohibited? What are the laws with practicing medicine and, and within the state? And that's what Louisiana has done. What practices performed by an exercise physiologist may be prohibited based on the scope of practice. So when we talk about a scope of practice, it's what is a, an exercise physiologist doing differently than a physical therapist, different than a dietitian, different than a nurse. So that's what a scope of practice is beginning to define. The problem with exercise is you as I've just said, is there's a lot can be overlap between professions, which makes it a little um, tricky is, you know, how, what can an athletic trainer do with prescribing exercise? What about a physical therapist or a PTA? So that's what we call the scope of practice. So potential liabilities um, from an exercise physiologist face when delivering, um, what are your potentials for harm, for injury, um, any type of negligence? Can you be sued for malpractice? Yes, you can be sued for malpractice. So that's when we talk about licensure within a state and who's regulating it. What recognition can be given to an exercise physiologist and their opinion in a variety of legal settings? So evaluating disability, workers' comp claims, insurance, um, you know, personal injury. Can we? Can they serve as a rep reputable expert witness? So that's kind of the licensure. Again, really not right now the only state is Louisiana. This is a comparison of qualifications for clinical exercise physiologists. So again, these slides are available. You can look on your own at them to be a little bigger. Um, but we have um, different organizations and I've listed the website. So this is in Australia. This is um, 
exercise and sports science in Australia. The second one is the American College of Sports Medicine, which is the certification I'm mainly speaking about right now, the CEP certification. Um, so what is the minimum degree you need? What is the minimum hours you need? That's one. Then the third one is the Canadian, Associ the Canadian um, Certified Exercise Physiologist. The next one is the American College of Sports Medicine, and they have a different one, um, and one a little bit lower, which is the EP, which is a really great one with a lot of students who sit for um, this exam right after getting their bachelor's. We have the American Council on Exercise. You know that is ACE. They have a medical exercise specialist um, certification. Again, you can take a look at how many hours you need and what you need with the bachelor's degree. Uh, medical Fitness Director which is a medical fitness association. If any of you have done your internships in any of our medical wellness, like I mentioned, Akron General, SUMA, you may be familiar. This is a very nice big um, organization that they also have a certification. And then we have the British um, certification. So these are all solid organizations. And I say solid because you can hop on the internet and you can see a lot of fluff, fluffy web-based certifications, which I don't encourage you to waste your money um, and pursue. So if you're going to get a certification, make sure it's, you know, a quality organization that you're going to really, it's going to be recognized and reputable. So comparison, this is another compar practical comparison on where um, types of requirements. So where are they going to be working? What are some of the patients? What are some of the um, clientele going to be? So I'm not going to, you know, give you specifics on each of these, but you'll see that some are going to be a lot more clinical and a lot more specific to cardiopulmonary rehab and others are more a little bit more fitness based more of the apparently healthy the khap c a a h e p this is going to be the little assignment we're going to do at the end of this lecture so the, um, this organization has established guidelines and standards for academic institutions to follow right so khap so a khap program so if you take a look at khap program some universities have begun to become accredited. Um, there are, we are not at the University of Akron an accredited KHAP institution. Um, some other universities in Ohio are. Um, you can take a look at which ones are and which ones aren't. But the movement be be towards becoming accredited is really important because that means what you're getting inside your courses aligns with the certification exam. So under KHAP for our field, they're, they have developed these things called COAs, right? So the COAs are really what we're following. The COAs are developed to help people become CEPs, right? So we get the information from some of our key organizations, and these are the ones I just listed on the other table, um, the table of where people become accredited through. So AACVPR is one I speak about a lot in some of my other classes, the American Association for Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab. AACVPR is an organization that gives us a lot of good information on what students need to be learning in the class to prepare for a job in cardiopulmonary rehab. MFA, right, that's the one I just mentioned, the American the Medical Fitness Association. So these are fitness facilities that are we call medical-based. So these are people in the community that we know they have risk factors, but we have people on the fitness floor that have a little bit... Um, more than a little bit, but a good amount of information to help keep things safe. So medical fitness, the MFA, exercises medicine, the American Heart Association, and the American College of Cardiology. Those are our big ones. So these COA sponsors, um, here are some additional ones with some of their direct websites, are going to help provide information. Um, ACSM, ACE, I really like the American Kinesiotherapy Association. If you're not familiar with this website, it's akta.org. The Cooper Institute, I just mentioned Ken Cooper in a couple of slides earlier. It's a very great website. It's where we get a lot of our great information. These are also great places for you to get, um, to take a look at, this is my dog barking. Um, for you to take a look at if you're looking for an internship. There's a cat outside the window. Um, so we're just going to pause for a minute. <laughs> but if you're looking for a unique internship at the graduate level, these websites, a lot of these websites have um, a listing of internships that are going to be different than just staying in Akron. Um, so I really encourage you to look at some of these so you have a lot more of an impressive resume when you conclude your master's degree that you didn't just go 
to a fitness facility here in town, which is fine. You're going to get decent, decent experience, but it's a really competitive job market. So you want your resume to be um, really impressive. So again, I'm showing you these websites to let you know, one, great source of information, two, great place to look for internships. Here's another table that looks again at organizations dedicated to both chronic disease and, debil and disability. I've learned about a lot of you um, on the discussion board and some of you know from previous semesters. You're looking at working with people that are in the population of being unhealthy. Um, I think it's a, you know this kind of higher risk, whether it's stroke, whether it's respiratory disease and pulmonary. Um, neuromuscular and balance, post-stroke, people in wheelchairs, disabilities, um, all of these unique special populations. They all, right, so here I have the category of what is the unique population, and then all the way over here on the left column, I have the exact website you're going to go to. So, you know, if you're looking for vision, you're looking for arthritis, you're looking for obesity, uh, cardiac, pulmonary, I want you to be really familiar with where are these organizations that we're getting our information from. Should you join them and become student members? Again, should you be looking for jobs on these websites, right? So understanding where to get your information from is what I really want you to be able to get from this class. In our field of practicing, whether you're, and many of you right now are doing this, where you're um, taking a look at training people, what do we need to be knowing about um, Legal, legal ramifications. So, so to appreciate what can be at stake for health professionals who become involved in a courtroom litigation is really important. And um, we'll elaborate on this as we move through the class. But if you're training somebody right now and they end up dying of a massive heart attack, um, you know what, what legal ramifications could those families take on you if you don't have the right documentation completed? So you want to realize that if you're taking someone's money and you're exercising them, you've gone through all of the assessments, you've signed off on all the right waivers. We know that exercise is a risk, but can you be liably, um, can you be sued? So well, that's something we want to think about and I can kind of help you on the side if this is something you're, you're wanting more information on yourself. We're going to spend a little time later in the semester looking at creating your own professional social media image, whether you use it or you don't, it's a place that I want you to be able to know where to get information from. And if you're already on LinkedIn, and I'm going to cough, so I don't want to cough, I you just listen to my dog bark. So on, if you're on LinkedIn, I'm going to encourage you to join two different groups. One, because I see a lot of jobs being posted, and two, because a lot of good information. One is, is just the general. If you just go to LinkedIn and type in clinical exercise physiology, there's a massive group, kind of like just a interest group. And um, there's students that will talk about preparing for an exam. There's job postings. Then there's the organization I'm really involved in. And you can join this organization on LinkedIn without being a member, but it's the C CEPA organization. So this is just the clinical exercise physiology and the one is CEPA. We'll talk more about these later when I get you to start looking at your own personal online um, presence because it just seems to be a place that more and more students are landing jobs. So what I want you to be familiar with right now is what is a CEP? How do we, um, de how do we define it? What type of certification could you have? What is the growing evidence that this field is going to, in the next couple of decades, explode, right? So even right now with, um, since March, since last March with COVID and people being stuck in their homes, obesity is on an upswing, a huge upswing. There's a need for being able to deliver remote, uh, digital, online personal training. Right, so I'll talk a lot about this this semester. There's a need for having quality fitness information. There's a lot of um, low-level fitness information online. You know that. There's a lot of people who claim to be fitness experts that are giving people um, complete garbage to follow. So what is the growing evidence that you can take someone who's high risk, blood pressure, stroke, heart disease, and give them a really good both aerobic strength, stretching, you know, full balanced neuromuscular program and be, um, you know, be confident with that. So what I'm going to have you do, to spend some time, I have you do two things this week. One is I want you to go to the U.S. Registry website. So I've given you the link um, on Brightspace. You're going to go to this website 
And um, I'm going to let you know, not all of our certifications are on there. So you'll notice though there are some exercise, I'm not going to give you the answer on which one it is, but that's not listed under here. But I want you to choose two that you're interested in. Find two certifications listed and talk about them. You're going to make a table, you're going to compare and contrast, you're going to upload that for points. Then you're going to go to the discussion and before Wednesday of this week, you're going to make your own thread and I want you to share with us what certification you're wanting to pursue. If you're already certified, that's fine. Tell us what you already have. Tell us how you prepare. Tell us, you know, what you know about it. But otherwise, by Wednesday, you're going to post to the discussion and by Sunday, we're all going to rebuttal back to everyone. So um, that's a little introduction on what is a CEP, where you go for information. I hope that's been beneficial. Remember, you can email, text, call, find me if you need help this week on anything. The key important thing is spend some time on um, the discussion board to really reply to each other. That's really what I want to be um, encouraging you to do in this online class.